Can you hear me, guys? Can you hear me? Take time, time to block. We'll begin in prayer soon. Wait for the regulars to show up. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah. yeah, the reason why I said two hours to Bozak, because Bozak, I love my Christian brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, but I don't love them enough. If you are reading the comment section, you would see I was indicating when we're about to go live. You'll see I said an hour, then I said 30 minutes, then I said 15 minutes. So when you come and you ask me what time you're going to go live, that means you're not reading, brother. So that means you want me to spoon feed you. There, there, Bozak, here you go. Here's some baby food, spoon feed you. Okay, go kill them. Sorry about that. Hold on. Sorry, people just don't know. Okay. You tell them stop and they don't listen. Right. Okay, so is that okay, Bozak? Bozak, where is the love? Listen, I'm trying to keep faithful to the rules. What are the rules? You will get um, automatically blocked if you mock, blaspheme, insult the triune God and his word. And you'll get automatically blocked if you're stupid enough to justify the murder of unborn children, calling abortion <clears throat> something lawful, <clears throat> If you do that, you're gone. And the mods have full permission. They have the authority to block at their own discretion any nuisances. Because even before I started the stream, I had to block a guy that I don't like. Unfortunately, he has a good name. Jesus is the mighty God. He comes here. He's a nuisance. He's a thorn. He's a pain and the aspirations. So I had to muzzle him and block him and send him to his merry way. So pray that the Lord Jesus gives us the grace to love each other to endure one another, to be patient with each other as Jesus is patient with us. And pray the Lord Jesus gives me the grace, the power of the Holy Spirit to exercise perfect self-control and to overcome my weaknesses. What's up, Mamanda? I like that name, Zori. Zori. It's a nice name. Zori. Because if you take away the Z and you put the G, it's Gori. This is my Gori. He's very Gori. Ah, by the way, for those of you who don't know Assyrian, Gori... Gori can mean my husband. But now, is it a coincidence? Gori sounds like gory, like something very gory. Is that a coincidence? I think not. You get it? Gori, that means my husband. But when you spell it out in English, it's gore, you know, like gory, like, ew, it's very gory. Ew, ew, that's my gory. It's like, it's like the ish and the isha. Moha, you know I'm going to block you for that, right? You know I'm going to block you? Because either you're stupid or your prophet was stupid, Mohammed. Because even your prophet and your scholars say Arabic came from Aramaic, from Syriac. So was your prophet stupid or are you stupid? Which one of you are stupid? Because you said Assyrian came from Arabic. Which one of you are the brain dumbasses? Because according to your prophet, as well as the Muslim scholars, Syriac predates Arabic, and they even believe that Syriac was the language of Jannah. So now who's the stupid one, you or your prophet? Was it your woman raping prophet that was the stupid idiot, or are you stupid for saying what you just said? Okay. Which one? Are you smarter than Muhammad? Camel urine be upon him? Moha, you, are you complaining about insults? You want me to show you your prophet insulting people? Don't play that game with me, man. Don't act stupid and play now victim. Because your prophet insulted people and even murdered people and he raped their wives. Okay? 
Camel urine be upon him. So Moha, do you want to stay here or do you want me to send you on your merry way? Because you're ready. You want proof? Okay. If I show you your prophet cursed and insulted his companions and an orphan girl, will you spit on him and say that he's a <clears throat> son of Satan? If I do that, if I waste my time, will you spit on him and say he's a son of Satan? Okay. You need to go now. Send him out of here. I don't want you here now because you, you just exposed yourself that you're a wicked liar. Okay, so get, get him out of here. Okay, thank you, guys. I was going to waste time on this guy, but he just showed himself. All right. Do you, have, do you see the audacity of the Muslims here? The Muslims, their prophet insulted people, cursed people, murdered people, raped the wives of people, turned women into whores and prostitutes, and they have the audacity to complain when we insult Muhammad. And I'm not lying. You guys know Muhammad, right? What do you call muta? Let me just try. Let's again. Let me explain this for those of you who don't know. Muhammad permitted temporary marriages called muta. Zawaj al-muta. Zawaj al-muta. You know what that is? For those Christians who don't know, Muhammad allowed his companions to go and find a woman and say, Hey, I want to marry you for three days and I'll give you some money. After three days, I divorce you. Now, ladies, ladies, help me understand. Maybe I'm stupid. If you're a dignified woman, if you are, unfortunately, we're living out of time where men and women whore around like it's going out of style. You have male whores and female whores who prostitute themselves for free just to gratify their sexual cravings to their shame and destruction. And so they wonder why <clears throat> they don't get respect. In fact, in fact, real quickly, women, do you know every time you allow a man to defy you sexually, you are degrading yourself, demeaning yourself so that others only see you as a piece of meat and they won't want to be with you in long-term serious relationships. They only want to be with you to sleep with you. Do you know that? Don't think that you're doing, you're doing yourself a favor when you keep sleeping around with men because you're destroying your reputation, you're dishonoring yourself and your body, a body that God gave you to use to glorify him. And you're going to have a reputation of being a whore that's only good <clears throat> for sex. And then you wonder why you end up with losers. And you wonder why you don't have long st lasting, fulfilling relationships. Okay. Now, for the dignified people here, for the dignified people and all Christians who believe in Jesus Christ, all Christians who believe in Jesus Christ, women and men, you are dignified because you are holy servants of Jesus to use your bodies for holiness and purity. Okay. Which woman would be okay with a man saying, hey, I want to marry you for three days and I'll give you some money. And when I'm done, I'll divorce you. Any of you okay with that? What do you call that? What do you call that? What do you call that? Prostitution. And these Muslims have an audacity to say, don't insult our, our, our prophet. Don't insult us. Really? Okay, anyway. May the Lord Jesus erase Muhammad's memory from the face of the earth and save Muslims from this filthy, wicked son of Satan. And that's what he is, Muslims, a son of Satan. And he's burning in hell by the power of Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus Christ. Okay, anyway. I don't want to talk about him. Pray that the regulars show up. You know, I don't want to be crying and hurting. You know, David Wood gets a 900. He gets a 1,000, and it's boring as pits. He puts people to sleep. All right, so let me just send you some links, and then we get in, begin in prayer. Ask Holy Spirit to fill me. Anoint me to speak clearly, articulately, passionately, and speak perfectly by the power of the Holy Spirit to magnify and glorify our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to share this link with you guys. Okay, that's a Facebook link. No, Magdalene, it's not that your tutorial is not helpful. What it is is I'm so lazy that I haven't gotten around. This is now what, the third, fourth time you sent me it, and I feel so hurt. You keep going out of your way to make tutorials, and I keep <clears throat> neglecting to watch them thoroughly and understand the procedure. I keep brushing it aside because I'm just the lazy bum. All right here.
That link right there, folks. You see that link? That's a Facebook link. Tell me if you can see the picture. Can you click on it and see the picture? Thank you, guys. Thank you for the support on Super Chat. The Lord Jesus bless you richly. Yeah, keep calling me shameless. Shimon. It's okay. I won't shame you. Someone here named Gabriel? Okay. So who saw that? When you click on that link. Gileche? No, not too much Orthodox defense. I can't stand it. Who sees that? Can everyone click on the link and see what picture pops up? Thank you, Nada. You know this sister loves me from her heart. The Lord Jesus bless her. Look what she said. Pray for a virtuous and patient woman from my Assyrian Bruce Lee brother, Sam. Whoa! Anyway. Okay. What name do you say? What name do you see, folks, in that link? Kent Bomer. Can you stop, bro? Kent Bomer. <sighs> pins and needles. Needles and pins. It's a happy man that grins. What am I mad about? If you see that picture, you know who that is? That's the man that led me to Jesus Christ. He was nine years old, and I was six and a half when he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the man. That's the man God used to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the man whose grandmother, Shmuni, taught us, taught us how to pray and worship Jesus. And it was his grandmother that taught me the Ave Maria. She taught me how to worship Jesus, how to pray to the Lord, and she taught me the Ave Maria. That's him right there, folks. That's the man. He was nine years old, and I was around six and a half when he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to me. That's him, right? That's him. He taught, uh, his grandmother, a godly woman, a blessed woman, and I pray the Lord Jesus blesses the session and Protects me from being <clears throat> a stumbling block to my neighbors in Jesus' name. Please, Lord, grant me favor. Right? He was nine years old, and I was six and a half, and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to me. And then his grandmother took me under her wing, and she would teach us how to pray and how to worship, and she taught me the Ave Maria. She also taught me a, a Syrian prayer that's actually still sung in the Assyrian churches. I don't know the exact pronunciation of some of the words. Now, those of you who are Assyrian will know this prayer. I'll be mispronouncing it because she taught it to me when I was six and a half. Okay, are you, are you listening? Okay. She taught me this. For you Assyrians, you should know this because they sing it in their worship, in the liturgy in the Church of the East. Now, there's one word there I don't know. So I've always mispronounced it since I was young. Qaddisha alaha. Qaddisha filthana, Qaddisha la mayuta. And then the rest of it, I can't, I don't know. I'll butcher it. Right? You know what I'm talking about? You guys know what I'm talking about? You who uh, speak Assyrian? She taught me that. I just don't remember all the words. And I know it's sung in the liturgy of the Assyrian churches of the East, right? Qaddisha alaha means God is holy. Qaddisha alaha, Qaddisha khilthana, which I don't know what that means. Qaddisha la mayutha, that means he's holy and he's deathless, he's immortal. Right? So Qaddisha alaha means God is holy. Qaddisha khilthana, uh, that part I don't know. With khilthana, I don't know what it means. And then Qaddisha la Mayutha. That means God who is immortal, deathless. Alan, modern Hebrew comes from Assyrian. Don't hate. Right? How are you doing, Junior Junior Martinez? Right? Yes, it is. Okay. So yeah, the Assyrian liturgy is beautiful. It's <clears throat> Magnificent, majestic, because if you understand the words in the liturgy in the Assyrian church, it is filled with praises to the triune God. It is filled with references from the Holy Bible. It is majestic. Right? Glorifying the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Filled with praises of the triune God and references to Scripture. And 
In fact, all liturgies, right? It's not just the Assyrian church. I went to the Orthodox church and they had the English translation and fill with praises, singing the glory of the triune God. So all liturgies basically magnify, glorify the triune God and are filled with references and allusions to the Holy Scriptures. Yeah, it's true. Not making it up. You can ask. The Assyrians who go to the Assyrian Church of the East, if they know the Assyrian language, the Orthodox here, as well as the Catholics, will tell you. Right? So with that said, Father, we love you. <clears throat> Son of God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, I ask that you sanctify us this morning. Purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ the Lamb. By the power of your Holy Spirit, mortify our flesh. Save us from our sinful passions. Save us from our sinful passions. Crucify our flesh. And Father, please save me from those areas of sinfulness that I struggle with. Help me to overcome and die to them, Father. Save me from impatience, unrighteous anger. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, train us and discipline us spiritually and give us the power to exercise Perfect self-control for the glory of Jesus Christ. May Jesus Christ increase in us. May we decrease and wash us in the blood of the Lamb. Wash our loved ones in the blood of the Lamb. Wash my daughters in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and seal my daughters. Seal our loved ones. Seal us by your Holy Spirit and flood us, our loved ones, my daughters, in your infinite love and compassion and mercy because <clears throat> you are a good God, a beautiful God, and worthy of our love and praise and worship. Help us to love you perfectly, Father, to love the Lord Jesus perfectly, to love your Holy Spirit. And Father, please fill my chest and my lungs and my throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this work, as long as you're pleased to keep me on earth to serve Jesus Christ and prepare us for our deaths, that when the time comes, we'll be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and sealed by the Spirit to look at death and laugh at death, knowing that death is not the end of us, because Christ has conquered death and he lives and can never die. And the Lord Jesus said, if he lives, we will live also. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. And Father, please save me from error, from stammering and confusion. And bless the internet connection. Grant them wisdom and knowledge, understanding, Father. Every one of them. Help us to know the scriptures more perfectly. Give us the power to live the scriptures more perfectly. Proclaim the scriptures. <clears throat> Love the scriptures and even die for the scriptures because the scriptures are your voice to us. And slave us to your voice, to the voice of Jesus, to the voice of the Holy Spirit that speaks perfectly in your word, the Holy Bible. Use me, Father. You don't need me. You do not need me. And I know this, but we need you. We depend on you, Father. We depend on you, Lord Jesus. We depend on you, Holy Spirit. Provide our daily bread until it's time for us to leave this world. And please, Abba, one thing I ask of you, keep my daughters perfectly healthy and safe. Grant them salvation through faith in Jesus. And may they outlive me, Father, and save them from irreparable damage. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Yehovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah Rapha, Yehovah Rapha. As you can see, I haven't shaved. Usually I shave. I asked my daughter last night, my oldest daughter. I go, Mommy, do you want me to shave? She goes, yeah, Baba, trim your beard. You know why? Pray for my angels, please. If I have found favor in your sight, bathe them in prayer that the Lord Jesus will love them and preserve them and bring them to me this year, please, Lord. And I can be in their life until they grow up. You know why she wants me to trim my beard? Because she doesn't want to see her Baba old, you know. My oldest is Sariah, meaning Princess of Jehovah, Princess of Jesus. And my youngest, her name is Zipporah. Zipporah is the name of Moses' wife, right? She doesn't want to see me old. And you know what she tells me? So I'll probably cry thinking about it. Mm. I'll probably cry thinking about it. She tells me, Baba, yeah, see, I'm going to cry. When you get old, I'll take care of you and I'll give you tomato soup. She's attached to my heart, and I'm attached to her heart, and my baby's heart, Zipporah. They really need their earthly bob in their lives, but I can't do anything about it, right? So pray for me, and pray in Jesus' name. I'm not a stumbling block to my neighbors, but I can be Jesus to them, and pray for my neighbor next door. He likes to jam the music loud, and he's starting to play it, and I can't handle noise. I get unnerved. 
So pray for that. Now let me get something to drink and we're going to begin. Pray. The Holy Spirit fills this session. I want to see 300, man. Why am I down to 160 again? I'm about to cry. <laughs> now that you're gone, I'll be crying. Hold on. Let me just get something to drink. Crying. Crying over you, crying over you, crying over you, now that you're gone, I'll be crying, crying, crying over you, crying over you crying over you now that you're gone by the way as you can see i'm in a regular shirt i can't dress up every day because i can't make the woman swoon just to let you know last night i had a pre-recorded discussion debate lord jesus willing it's going to appear on youtube within the upcoming week <clears throat> within the upcoming week, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I debated one of the leading defenders of oneness theology named Roger Perkins. Now, I know Roger Perkins has debated James White and a few others. I knew James White. I didn't know everyone else that he debated, so I asked him even during discussion. But I've never watched his debates, never looked at his videos or read his articles. And we had a debate last night, Trinity versus Oneness. And he's supposed to be one of their best. All I can say, and I hope I don't come off boasting or sounding arrogant, may the Lord Jesus crucify my flesh. And he's actually listening to me because he spent about a month. He kept delaying our discussion. He spent about a month studying my videos and articles, thinking that that would help him. All I can say, and I'm trying to be as honest as I can without sounding arrogant, it was a decimation. He got decimated because you cannot defend a false God. You cannot defend a God that doesn't exist, a Jesus that doesn't exist. You cannot defend a doctrine of Satan, a satanic doctrine, because the Holy Bible is the word of the triune God. The God who exists is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Bible is the revelation of the triune God. And glory to God, he got decimated. It was very bad. You'll even see my reaction. I'm laughing and shaking my head because he actually thinks he knows Hebrew and Greek. And I used the languages against him. It got so bad that he kept accusing me of having a habit to attack my opponents and talk over them. But you're going to watch. He kept trying to cut me off and he kept attacking me personally. And embarrassed himself because he is a son of Satan and his God doesn't exist. His God is a satanic counterfeit. So glory to the triumph God. Another oneness minister bites the dust and his God was exposed for being a God who doesn't exist but a doctrine of Satan. Glory to the triumph God. It was a decimation. Even my friend was embarrassed by his performance. It's going to come out this week. I'll get you the link. But don't let me affect your view of the debate. I want you to look at it and honestly tell me if you think he did good. Be honest with me. I won't be upset. But I was laughing and because he's supposedly one of their best. This is the second oneness apologist that I debated. And glory to the triune God. Glory to the triune God. The second oneness <clears throat> apologist that got decimated by the grace of the triumph God, Father, Son, Spirit. And let this encourage every one of you guys. Let me encourage you. I have no formal theological training. Never been to college, never been to seminary, never been to university. Folks, if you believe Jesus is alive, he's real, and you seek his face, and you trust in him, and believe he has given you the Holy Spirit to know him, and ask him for the wisdom to know him and the power to love him, he will reveal himself and he will pour out his love, his grace, and his wisdom on you and make you a vessel to glorify his name and destroy every argument to take every thought 
captive for his glory. And I'm proof of it. If someone without formal education can do it, because God is real and he works through broken vessels, imagine what he can do through you if you believe, if you receive, and if you yield to him. So let me encourage you. You don't need to be an Einstein. You don't need to be a genius. All you need to do is trust in Jesus. Submit to Jesus. Yield to Jesus and seek the face of the Spirit, and he will do wonders in and through you for his glory. Okay? You can't. You guys can't hear the music, can you? The music is distracting you. I'll put on my plugs. Okay, good. Let me know when it becomes a distraction because I get discombobulated. So let me give you the articles that I used for the discussion yesterday. Here are the articles. Here are the articles I used for the discussion. Guys, when I tell you, please... Go to my YouTube channel. Watch all the discussions I've had for the past two years. Go to the websites, answeringislam.net, answeringislam.net. Look for individual authors. Look for me, Sam Shamoon. Look for Anthony Rogers. And go to my blog. Go to my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. I promise you, if you study the materials that we produced, you will be so thoroughly equipped I promise you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, empowering you to understand the material, you will dis decimate and destroy every objection against the Trinity, against the deity of Jesus Christ, against the person of the Holy Spirit, and the authority of scriptures. And it's all there, free of charge. All you need to do is be disciplined and take the time to study the material. First priority, study your Bible. The Bible is God's perfect word. Study it. Understand it and ask the Spirit to give you the power to live it out and worship your God. Worship Him. Pray to Him. Thank Him. Praise Him. Love Him. Sing to Him. That's your number one priority. And then study these materials. So here are the articles that we used, I used for yesterday's talk. Here it is. This is article number one. Let me post it twice. And by the way, someone was wondering, for some reason, I think there's a glitch in YouTube. That when the session is done and it's archived, the comments section, the comments don't appear anymore. And that's not just on my channel. I've gone to other <clears throat> YouTube channels. And when I click on a stream that's archived, the, the comments don't show up. I don't know why. I don't know why. That's beyond my control. I think it's something with YouTube. There may be a YouTube glitch, a glitch in YouTube. And it's not just me. I've gone to other channels when they've had a live stream. See, here goes my firstborn. She's calling me. How's my firstborn this morning? Guess what I'm doing, Mommy? You got it today? Yeah. Okay, guess what? I just began a live stream, and we were praying for you. You want to say hi to them? Yeah. Look how beautiful my firstborn is, guys. Look at her. Hi. Hi. Tell me, guys, Jesus hasn't blessed me with the two most gorgeous, beautiful girls in the world. Do you see how beautiful my firstborn is? And my baby is beautiful. Look how beautiful she is. She is uh, she, she is from my heart from Jesus. Her and her sister, my heart from Jesus. See, they're looking at you, Mommy. They're seeing your face. We love you. We just prayed, asking Jesus to bless you and your sister and bring me to you and bring you to me. Amen? Amen. I love you. When I'm done, I'll call you. Okay, well, I love you. You got your pens? Yeah. Good. Anything you want, send me. And after I'm done, I'll text you to call me, okay? okay. I miss my firstborn, my baby. I love you. Love you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Bye. Bye, baby. Mwah. Jesus bless you. He loves you. Whew. Boy. Anyway. I'd be more blessed if I had them with me. You know, it's hard, right, folks? You guys know. Even though I can talk to them, my heart still breaks and aches because I can't hold them and kiss them for now. Guys, please beg Jesus for a miracle. You know, I don't want to be without them <clears throat> anymore. But pray for me. Anyway, you got that article? That was one? Yeah, anyway, let me focus. Here's the other article. <clears throat> Here's the other article. Uh, King Bundy, King Buddy, my friend, I know you're concerned. Too late. There's Facebook. My, Their pictures are on Facebook. 
Jesus will protect my daughters. If I start worrying about this stuff, then you know what? I'll be handicapped and I won't be able to do ministry. So thank you, King, King Buddy. Now, King Buddy, can you give me your real name and your Facebook so that I can also advertise it on my YouTube channel? Okay, here's the other article, folks. The second article. Click on them, save them, and use them. Click on them, save them, and use them. Now, here's the third article. Here's the third article. Okay? Save these articles. This is the third article. I'm posting the links to each article twice. Okay? And then one more that's going to be used in today's session. One more that's going to be used in today's session. The mark in Jesus. The physical embodiment and visible appearance of Israel's God. The mark in Jesus. The physical embodiment and visible appearance of Israel's God. It's okay, King Buddy. I want you to start a Facebook with your real name so I can then show your picture to the world. Right? Don't be scared, friend. Christ is on your side. Don't be scared. Don't be a little chicken. Bok, bok! Chicken. Did everyone got get those links? You guys got those links? I know Hepsa likes that. That's why I did the pop up because Hepsa likes when I imitate chicken. Bok, bok! Okay. So, folks, I promise you, the. Arguments that we present in the articles and rebuttals and on the YouTube channel, they are battle-tested arguments. These are arguments we use in actual debate. And by the grace of God's Spirit, these arguments have been sharpened and they stand <clears throat> irrefutably. They can't be refuted because God has graced us with the truth. If you know the truth, understand the truth, live the truth, and are able to articulate it, you can't be refuted. So I'm giving you arguments that I use in debates with anti-Trinitarians, and they can't refute them. Glory to the triune God. Roger Perkins is another one who bit the dust because he worships a false god. May God have mercy on his pathetic soul and bring him to the Trinity because he was boasting. I used to believe in the Trinity. Yeah, now you worship a false god. May God have mercy on your pitiful soul in Jesus' name. Are we ready now? Hafsa, do you want me to do the... you want me to do the chicken thing again? Bok, bok! Hey, how many of you guys like my Arabic pronunciation of Paul's name and my Arabic imitation of Paul's name? Bulis, bulis. Because Paul in Arabic is bulis. B-U-L-U-S. Bulis. Bulis, brother. Bulis. Radiallahu anhu. Bulis, Bulis, alayhi salam, Bulis, Bulis, brother. His name is Bulis. Now let's begin. Father, be glorified. Lord Jesus, be glorified. Holy Spirit, be glorified. Take over in Jesus' name. Bulis, brother. Bulis. All right. We're continuing where we left off yesterday. We are, we are continuing where we left off yesterday. I was finishing an in-depth discussion of Mark's Christology, what Mark believes about Jesus Christ, to understand what Jesus meant in Mark 13, 32. So if you didn't listen to yesterday's session, you need to go listen and re-listen until it becomes second nature and you understand the arguments so that you can then teach these arguments. You can then use these arguments so that you can equip other Christians to know what our Lord meant in Mark 13, 32, that he does not know the dare hour. So I'm going to now continue from where, we're, where we left off. Yesterday, we saw how the first two chapters of Mark present Jesus as the God of Israel in the flesh. So you have had to have heard yesterday's session to follow with this session. Mark chapter 1 and 2 depict Jesus as the God of Israel in the flesh, Yahweh. I prefer to say Yahovah. Some like to say Yahweh, that's fine. <clears throat> you can say Jehovah as well. That he's Jehovah God in the flesh. But at the same time, Mark depicts Jesus as the Son of God and the eternal companion of the Spirit. Even though he doesn't use the word eternal, the companion of the Holy Spirit. Because in Mark 1, 9, 11, you have the Holy Spirit descending in visible shape like a dove, resting on Jesus. And God speaking from heaven audibly for John to hear and his son to hear 
where God says that Jesus is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. So there you have the father speaking to the son, and there's the spirit. So Jesus is the companion of the spirit. The spirit is the companion of Jesus, and Jesus is the son of God, and yet Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. That's why we're Trinitarians, because the New Testament writers were Trinitarians. They were not Unitarians, right? So we established that yesterday. So I want to look at a few more examples showing that for Mark, Jesus isn't a creature who's inferior to the Father in essence, but that Jesus is the eternal divine Son who became flesh. He's one with the Father in his essence, even though he took on a human nature, a physical body that's created and finite and temporal, right? Jesus' human nature, his physical body is created. Because it's created, it's finite, it's limited, it's temporal, meaning it isn't beginningless. <clears throat> it had a beginning, and now he possesses that human nature and physical body forever, and that physical body is bound to time, space, and place. So when you talk about Christ, you're talking about a person that has two natures. He has the nature of God, and as God, he's one with the Father in essence, in glory, in power. But then he took on a human nature, and that human nature makes him one with us. Makes him one with us. He's part of the human family. He is our brother because he is human like us with one distinction. He's sinless, whereas all humanity after the fall of Adam and Eve are sinful. And he became one of us to then elevate us and transform us to become like him in his humanity. We will be deathless human beings with physical bodies that are indestructible, and we will be like him, morally incorruptible, where we cannot ever commit immorality again and sin ever again. Is that clear? You guys want my article on the incarnation? What does it mean to say that Jesus became flesh? What do we mean when we say Jesus became flesh and what we do not mean? Do you want that article? How many of you guys want that article as well? See, I'm trusting when I give you the articles, you will save them and you have permission to print them or upload them to your sites, study them and use them. And I'm, again, I'm telling you, start your own YouTube channels, use the information, but articulate it in your own way. Don't be parrots and puppets repeating what I say word for word or what David Wood says. Take the material and make it your own and present it in your own way and start local Bible studies in your churches. Right? Now, let me get you that article. I don't know who's honking the horn, but it's bothering me. So we can begin. All right? Someone's honking the horn, and I don't know why they're honking the horn. You know? I miss my girls, man, so much. Here it is. Here's my article. An articulation of the doctrine of the glorious Trinity, uh, incarnation, an articulation of the doctrine of the glorious incarnation. Here it is. That's it. I explain the incarnation, what it means for Jesus to be God who became flesh, what it means and what it doesn't mean. Let me post it a third time. Save these links because I do not know if YouTube is going to correct this glitch so that the comments will appear after this is archived. I don't know. No, I don't explain that, Bozak, because Bozak, help me. I don't know if I should call you Bozo or Bozak. What would you rather have me call you, Bozo or Bozak? Because I'm tempted to call you Bozo. Do you know why, uh, Bozak? I want to call you Bozo. Yeah, and thank the mods. I'll put in the description box. They, they will put these articles in the description box. Thank the mods. They don't get paid for doing this. They do this out of their love for Jesus. The reason why I'm debating whether I should call you Bozo or Bozak, uh, Bozo, do you see what the title of the session is? Bible Objections Refuted, Mark 13, 32, and Hebrews 1, 5, Part 3. So now I think we should change your name to Bozo because now you ask me a question that's not related to this topic so that I can abandon the topic so I can answer your question. So you see why I prefer to call you Bozo? And I say this in love because I love you. Now, if you're Bozo, I'm just waiting for Cookie the Clown. Now I'm dating myself. You guys are too young. You don't remember how many of you guys, how many of you guys remember Bozo and Cookie? 
See, you guys, I'm dating myself. This is why many of you didn't get the joke. Growing up, there used to be the Bozo Show. Bozo the Clown and Cookie the Clown. So I'm going to nominate Bozak as the official Bozo of my YouTube channel. Now I'm looking for Cookie. Yes, very scary than Pennywise. Now, with that said, let's begin. I already established from Mark chapter 1 and chapter 2 that Jesus is identified as Jehovah God in the flesh, the Son of the Father, and the companion of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, I'm going to look at a few more examples from Mark to show that for Mark, Jesus is God in the flesh. In other words, when you come to Mark 13, 32, <clears throat> and there Jesus says, Of the dear hour, no man knoweth, nor the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father alone, but the Father only. Mark 13 is near the end of Mark. Mark does not want you to look at that verse and ignore all that came before it. Mark 13 is near the end. You have 12 chapters that came before Mark where Mark has gone out of his way to demonstrate who Jesus is by Jesus' actions, his deeds, and his words. Do you think that Mark intended his readers to skip those 12 chapters and go to Mark 13 and look at verse 32 in isolation and then assume that Mark 13, 32 is the linchpin, the key verse telling us who Jesus is and he wants you to ignore all that he wrote prior? So this is how you know this is how you know a person's not serious and he's not interested in truth. When someone is going to go near the end of the book and take one verse out of the context of the chapter and the book as a whole in order to make it say something it wasn't intended to say, then you know that person doesn't care about truth. He's either demonized, right, and therefore wants to pervert the truth, or he's ignorant, and that can still be because of demonization. So this is where you come in. The Bible is your sword. If you're a Trinitarian and you worship the Trinity, the Bible is the sword the Spirit has given you to use in spiritual battle. Don't let your enemies take your sword and use it. It is your sword. It is your weapon for you to use in spiritual combat for the glory of Christ. That means it's up to you to know the Bible, and how to use it. Phil, you know you're going to have to leave, huh? Phil, you know you're gonna, you need to get out of here now, right? Because you're a demon too. You are a son of Satan. You know that, huh, Phil? Do you know why I'm telling you that? You just asked me about Sola Scriptura, when I'm going to talk about it. And instead of being patient, now you're attacking Sola Scriptura, not only the Bible. Phil, I don't want people like you on my channel. I am sorry. I'm trying to live up to my own convictions. I don't want... People like you here. I don't know how much plainer I can make it. Sorry, guys, for the distraction. Okay? So now let me show you. And you know what's ironic? Phil Khuzam, if he tries to defend the statement of Jesus by going outside of the Bible, they will laugh in his face and say, you see, the Bible is your enemy. And it's people like this that do a discredit, a disservice to those churches that don't affirm Sola Scriptura. You know that, right? Let me explain to you why. You have Catholics and Orthodox and Assyrian Church of these, but do believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired, infallible word of God, but it's not just the Bible that God has given his church. There's also apostolic tr tradition and the proper interpretation of both. But let me say this to the Catholics and the Orthodox. When you're not able to refute an anti-Trinitarian from Scripture, all you're doing is justifying their sick, perverted, demonized minds. The Bible is against you. It doesn't teach your doctrine. Your doctrine is a man-made tradition or a satanic tradition that contradicts the Bible. You're not doing yourself a favor and a service when you cannot demonstrate what you believe about the Godhead from Scripture. Are you with me here? I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to be your brother and friend. So don't be my enemy and attack what I believe. You don't believe Sola Scriptura? I'm not telling you to believe it. Don't come here and attack it when you know I believe it. And I'm letting you know, abandoning the scriptures and your articulation of the Trinity does not work with the Roger Perkins, 
does not work with an Anthony Buzzard, does not work with a Gregory Stafford. It will not work with these individuals who think, and they say this, by the way, the Catholic Church created the doctrine of the Trinity, a man-made doctrine, if not a satanic doctrine, that contradicts the Bible. So if you're a Protestant and you're protesting against the corruptions of the Catholic Church and get, getting rid of all of its unbiblical teachings, then you should get rid of the Trinity because that is an unbiblical teaching. You are not helping your case. You understand? And why wouldn't you, as a Catholic, Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East, seek to prove what you believe from Scripture? Because, again, Alan Ruhul can correct me if I'm wrong. I recall Scott Hahn saying that the Catholic Church doesn't affirm sola scriptura, but prima scriptura. The Scriptures are primary. Prima Scriptura, if I'm using the Latin slogan correctly, because I think I heard it from him or I read it from one of his books. Okay? Yeah, Prima Scriptura. So why would you not want to know the biblical basis for what you believe? I don't get it. Uh, can you help me understand the logic? So see me as your brother serving you, showing you the biblical basis for your beliefs. Prima Scriptura. Scriptures are primary. My goodness. <laughs> I need to find another line of work. <laughs> we were sailing along on the moonlight bay. <laughs> anyway, let's begin. Man, I'm an angry old Assyrian. I'm an angry, old, ugly, fat, bald Assyrian. I'm angry because I'm bald. I'm angry because I'm fat. I'm angry because I'm alone. Can you help me overcome my anger and not add to my anger, please? You know, when I look at myself and I see that I'm bald and I got love handles, nobody loves to handle. I'm angry that God didn't choose Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jennifer Lopez to be my parents. Because if Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jennifer Lopez were my parents... I would have the most awesome set of genetics in the world. I would be a gorgeous hunk, beastly hunk. But alas, God chose that I would have an aging, bald, fat father and an aging mother who gained a few pounds, still beautiful, but gained a few pounds, and then have them pass those genetics to me. <laughs> it's not fair, I tell you. We were sailing along. Moonlight Bay. All right. Let's begin, folks, in Jesus' name. Daryl, it would mean a lot if you were a woman who loved Jesus and said I was good looking. But you're a bro. Of course, as a bro, you're going to do what bros do. No, homie, you know you're good looking, bro. I got you back. You a bro, homie. And you don't know me. Don't think you can kick it to my lady Naomi, homie. All right, let's begin. Are we ready? In Jesus' name. No distractions. Lord, rebuke the distractions. I'm trying to make it entertaining so you don't get angry, all right? All right, let's, let's begin. So now, even if you don't believe sola scriptura, you should affirm prima scriptura and seek to find the biblical basis for what you believe. So let me help you. Let me help you, please. I want to help you. I want to fight you. <laughs> okay. Let's continue. Let's go to Mark 6. Here's the article. Mark 6. Mark 6. Is Anna here? What happened to Anna growing? I don't see her anymore. Did she get upset with me or something? She used to be here. Okay, Mark 6. That's the article. Mark 6, 45 to 52. How does Mark's gospel identify Jesus? Here we go. This guy showed up again. Philip showed up again. Oh, my goodness. Mark 6, 45, 52. Oh, she is? She's very silent, Anna. Anna, what happened? The cat got your tongue? Mark 6, 45, 52. Let's read. Let's read together. And straightway, immediately, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida. Pay attention, guys. 
How does this prove Jesus is God? While he sent away the people, and when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone in the land. And he saw them toiling. He saw them toiling. Sorry, I lost my place. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. The wind was opposing them. And about the fourth, wa fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. Guys, remember the words, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, meaning a ghost, right? <clears throat> For they also saw him, all saw him, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. I'll come back to that in a minute. Be not afraid. Okay? <clears throat> and he went up and un unto them into the sea, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. They were shocked and astonished. Who is this person? He walks on the seas. He tames the seas and the winds and the waves, and they obey him. Who is this person? For they consider not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Now, everyone with me here? Everyone with me here? You remember the part it says, and would have passed by them? This is all in my article. If you do not understand the Old Testament background, you're going to miss the meat of this passage. The phrase pass by them is used in the Old Testament. Here's where I need you to pay attention. And all of this is in the article. Everything you need to learn this stuff and teach it is in the article. We're providing the material for you because, please, I want you to learn it. I want you to absorb it. I want you to teach it. You know how many Christians will be blown away and how many Christians will be strengthened and have no doubt that they have the true faith and the Trinity is God if they are exposed to this information? Most people that leave the faith is because they didn't know the faith. They were not anchored in the faith and didn't hear this kind of material. Be used of the Spirit to save your brothers and sisters from being ensnared by the devil and plucked away thinking that the Bible is incoherent babble and there is no good evidence that Jesus is God or that he was raised from the dead. Please use it. Remember the saying Jesus says, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Just like now you're being blessed. See, I'm doing something unto you. Use of the spirit to strengthen you. Do that to your neighbor. Do that for your neighbor if you love him. Now, that phrase passed by them. Passed by them. If you don't know your Old Testament, you won't know that this is an Old Testament expression referring to God appearing visibly, manifesting his glory visibly. So you understand what I'm saying? Exodus 33, 21 to 23. Exodus 33, 21 to... 23. Thank you, George Adishu. God bless you, brother. I don't know. I can't hold the candlestick to any of these men, but thank you. Exodus 31, 21 and 23. Read with me. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me and thou shalt stand upon a rock and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by. My glory passeth by that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. I pass by. And I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Did you catch it? The expression pass by, pass by them, is an Old Testament expression referring to God's glory passing you by, referring to God passing you by, in other words, it's simply the biblical way of saying God appearing to you, revealing his glory to you visibly. Did it sink in? Did it sink in? Can I ask you something, Orthodox Defense? 
Why are you bringing up Sola Scriptura again? Orthodox defense, help me understand. Why did you just bring that up again? Did I just waste my time talking about Sola Scriptura? So I don't understand what you're trying to do. Oh, let me see if this guy's deliberately being used of the devil who, who claims to love me and he just had to take a swipe at Sola Scriptura. Orthodox defense, give me a good reason for keeping you on. For being a satanic distraction again. Give me a good reason. Give me a good reason. Because you just allowed Satan to use you to distract everybody. Hold on, guys. I'm sorry. I just chided Phil, and this guy couldn't control himself, and he did that. You better speak up, Orthodox Defense, because you know the time is clicking. Tick-tock, time to block. Give me a good reason to keep you on the channel because your wicked, filthy flesh got the best of you. You had to take a swipe at Sola Scriptura. Okay. Christos Anesti, I will give you the honor. You know what to do to Orthodox Defense, right? You know what to do for him, right? Christos Anesti, I give you the honor. Now, Exodus 34, 5 to 7. Send our friend to Asheron. Exodus 34, 5 to 7. Go ahead. Exodus, because people can't control themselves. You Christians cannot control yourselves. You have to act up and fight. Exodus 34, 5 to 7. Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. Let's read. Focus in Jesus' name, because you see Satan's going to try to distract us. Satan's going to try to distract us. Focus. Exodus 34, 5 to 7, because he doesn't want you to learn these things and get into side talk. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with them there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Stood with him there. Now pay attention. And the Lord passed by before him. And the Lord passed by before him. And proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That, the, that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children, children, and to the third and to the fourth generation. Now, rebuke these distractions of the devil in Jesus' name. Did you see what it said? The Lord passed by Moses. And what does that passing by mean? The Lord revealed his glory visibly, revealed himself in some visible manner for Moses to behold. So are you listening? What does the expression pass by mean? Exactly, Jade. Everyone listening? Passed by? Did you catch the point? Before I move on? So when Mark says, Jesus passed by them, that's Mark's way of telling you, Jesus is the glory of God revealed. This is what we call a Christophany theophany, an unveiling of the identity of Christ. And who is Christ? The God of the Old Testament appearing in visible glory. That's what you're supposed to see if you understand Mark's language in light of the Old Testament background. And this is even clearer when you compare the Greek version of the Old Testament with what Mark writes in Greek. So these are all these nuggets in Mark that if you don't understand the Old Testament, you won't understand what's happening in Mark. But Mark assumes that his readers are anchored in the Old Testament and will see what's happening here. And what's happening here? Jesus passed by them walking on the water to tame the wind and the waves. All of which the Old Testament says is what Yahweh does, Jehovah does. Now, let me give you another example. Another example. This one is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 13. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 13. Okay? I hope I'm not losing you guys. I hope you're learning. I hope you're being blessed. You're being stretched. And you're seeing how amazing and how deep this word is. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 13. Pay attention. Pay attention to Elijah. Notice who speaks to Elijah. Notice 
who is going to appear and speak to Elijah. Okay. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, behold, I don't know if you're going to catch it. The word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? I don't think you caught it. Who came speaking to him? Behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Let's continue reading. And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of Israel, the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, throw down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now watch here, 11. Hold on, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. Hold on. And it was so when Elijah heard it. I'm sorry. I skipped. Verse 11. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And before, and behold, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue. Behold, the Lord passed by. And Jesus passed by them. And behold, Jehovah passed by. But catch it. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains, right? And break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Ah, my friend, where was the Lord? Verse 12. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice, there was the Lord. The voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord. There you'll find the Lord when you find Jesus, the voice and word of the Lord. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, behold. There came a voice unto him, a voice unto him, came to him and said, where, what doest thou here, Elijah? <whistles> yes, the, uh, mods, today's a special day. Anyone who talks about a subject not related to the topic, you know, they're just being deliberately a nuisance to distract. Send them to Asheron. Did you guys catch it? I don't think you caught it. I'm going to read it from the modern English version. I'm going to read it from the modern English version. Read. He came to a cave and camped there, and the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, who said to him? The word of the Lord. Why are you here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, throw down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. He said, go and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Stand before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. Wow. By the way, it gets a better. It gets a better. It gets a better. And a great and strong wind split the mountains and broke it in pieces. Broken pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake came. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire came. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. A still small voice. Okay. Read. I'm posting the relevant sections. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in a cloak and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And a voice came to him and said, why are you here, Elijah? But wait, you didn't catch it. Notice here in 13, a voice came to him and said, why are you here, Elijah? But wait, in verse 9, that voice is said to be the word of the Lord. There you go. Here's verse 9. He came to a cave and camped there, and the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, Why are you here, Elijah? Did you make the connection? The voice is the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is the voice. 
And notice where he found the Lord. He found the Lord in the voice. He didn't find him in the wind. He didn't find him in the fire. He found him in the voice. See, if you want to find the Lord, you have to find Jesus. Because apart from the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord, apart from Jesus, you cannot find God. Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. Oh, I feel like dancing. Who didn't get it? Who didn't get it? Come on now. I don't want to put you to sleep. I don't want to bore you if this is bo boring, you guys. I'm here to serve you, and if I'm of no service, then I'll just walk away. No, Alan Ruhol, I know you're excited to connect it to the transfiguration. No, sir. It's okay. I know you want to, brother, but I, I love you, but not too much. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. Okay. Now, let me show you something else. How does this connect to Mark 6, 45 to 52? Watch here. I'm using the Tree of Life version in this article. Now, now let's go back and see. Watch here. This is Mark 6, 45, 52. 52. Watch here, guys. Watch here. Yeshua comes to them walking on the sea, and he went, wanted to pass by them. Wait, what did Jesus want to do? Pass by them. But wait, didn't we just read on the Old Testament? Thank you, Paul. Didn't we just read on the Old Testament? The Lord Jehovah passed by Moses. Jehovah's glory passed by Moses. The Lord Jehovah passed by Elijah. And in that context, Elijah found the Lord Jehovah in the word of Jehovah, the voice of the Jehovah, Jehovah who came to speak to him. Who is that word? Who is that voice? The Bible says that's the word, the voice who became flesh, Jesus Christ. So Jesus has been there from the beginning as the voice of the Father, as the word of the Father, revealing God to his servants. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. Everyone getting it or no? So do you see that in Mark 6, 45, 52, Jesus walking on the water, passing by them, <clears throat> echoes the Old Testament language of Jehovah passing by his servants to make his glory known. And it also echoes Job chapter 9, verse 8. Job chapter 9, verse 8. Let's look at Job chapter 9, verse 8. Jesus walks on the waters, on the seas, to tame them, to trample them, to subdue them, because he is master and Lord, sovereign over the winds and the waves. Job 9, which alone, speaking of Jehovah, which alone spreadeth out the heavens. He alone does this and treadeth upon the ways of the sea. How is it Jesus is doing Everything the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah alone. How is that, folks? Why is Mark ascribing to Jesus the characteristics, the functions that the Old Testament attributes to Jehovah alone? But here's another part you didn't catch. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. Let me show you what the Greek says. Pedro, John 1, 18. Okay, now watch here. Thank you, Ortho Christos. Now watch this. Bless you, everyone. Watch this. Mark 6, 50. You know what Jesus actually says in the Greek? Watch here. Mark 6, 50. Take courage. I am. Ego I me. He didn't say it is I. He said, take courage. I am. I am. Jesus says... I am the expression that Jehovah, Yahweh, uses of himself in Deuteronomy 32, 39, in Isaiah 41, verse 4, in Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 13, in Isaiah 46, verse 4, in Isaiah 51, <clears throat> verse 12, and 52, verse 6. You with me there? Take courage. 
I am. No, it's not Ehye Asher Ehye. No, Tony. Please don't appeal to that because it's that's a debatable translation. The passages I cited are in Hebrew are Anihu or Anochihu. I am, which in the Greek was rendered as Ego I me, Ego I me, Ego I me, Anihu, Anochihu, Ego I me. Let me just give you a few examples. Deuteronomy 32 39. Deuteronomy 32 39. Exactly, Alex Geskin. I hope you're loving the meat. And this meat from the Holy Spirit, the gift of Jesus' grace, is blowing your minds. Where does Jehovah use I am? Here, Deuteronomy 32 39. See now that I even I am He. Guys, check the Greek. Anihu is rendered in the Greek as ego I me. Ego I me. So in these passages, Jehovah, it's in Hebrew, is saying anihu or anochihu, which the Greek renders as ego I me. What do you have in Mark 6.50? Jesus says, take courage, ego I me. In a context where he displays his divine glory as he passes them by and tramples the seas, all of which is ascribed to Jehovah. And you want to convince me, Mark does not teach that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh. To those who are blind, yes. But to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear and understand Old Testament background, understand the Old Testament foundation of the New Testament, he is Jehovah in the flesh, the Son of the Father, the companion of the Holy Spirit. You see why we're Trinitarians? You see why we're Trinitarians? Isaiah 43, verse 10. No, it's actually Allah Numrud VA. It's not Allah Ashur, it's Allah Numrud. <laughs> okay. Isaiah 43, verse 10. Amen, Jade. You know that was Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit, if He is speaking to you, will confirm the Bible He produced and not contradict it. So, Jade, praise Holy Spirit that He made it known to you and now confirms it in the scriptures He produced. Now, Isaiah 43, 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith Jehovah, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Guess what the Greek is? When they translate in the Greek, that you may believe, ego I me. Before me there was no God, form, neither shall there be after me. Ego I me. Isaiah 41.4. Isaiah 41.4. Is Panagia Anna under a different name? Because I haven't seen her, my poor sister. Who hath wrought and done it? Calling the generations from the beginning. I, Jehovah Lord, the first and with the last. I am he. Guess what the Greek is? And this is her in Hebrew, but guess what the Greek is? Ego I me. Jehovah, ego I me. Wow. But what did Jesus say in Mark 6.50? Take courage. Ego I me. I am. She's very awfully silent today, my sister. She's kind of scaring me. I hope she's not sick. You're breaking my heart, Anna, because usually you're very vocal. You know, you say that at least finally some truth was heard for the first time. That means all these years I wasted my time speaking falsehood. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Let me give you another one. Isaiah 48, 12. Isaiah 48, 12. Watch here. This one is very powerful because I'm going to connect to Revelation. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. In the Greek, ego I me. I'm the first. I also am the last. Now notice the three titles. Jehovah says, ego I me. That's in the Greek. I know the Hebrew doesn't say ego I me. But in the Greek, it's ego I me. Jesus says, ego I me. And then he says, I'm the first. I also am the last. Go to Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Revelation 1, 17, 18. So Jehovah is the I am he. Ego I mean Greek, I am the first and I'm also the last. Revelation 1, 17, 18. No matter what you do. Very nice. Watch here. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. 
Amen. And have the keys of hell and of, of death. Wait. The I am the first last says, I died and I live forevermore. I came to life. So Jesus just said, I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last who was dead and now live forevermore. And he also said, Ego I me, I am. All of which Jehovah says about himself. We probably upset her. I probably she got upset. Hope not. Lord have mercy on her. Anyway, if it's okay, focus. Does everyone see? Could it be any clearer that what you have in Mark 6 is a Christophany, an unveiling of Jesus' divine identity, that he is Jehovah of the Old Testament who became flesh? Is that clear? Everyone got that? So do you think now that in Mark 13, 32, Mark wants to undo all of what he's just stated in these previous chapters and get you to conclude that Jesus isn't Jehovah in the flesh because he doesn't know that they're our. That's what Mark wants you to believe. Notice this is the sixth chapter. We haven't even gotten to chapter 13 yet. Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3, and all. By the time you get to Mark 13, Mark has gone out of his way, out of his way to show you this Jesus is the God of Israel become flesh, who is the son of the father. He's not the father and the eternal companion of the spirit. In other words, it's a Trinitarian gospel. So you actually think in Mark 13, 32, Mark's intention was to say, oh, he's not God. He's a finite creature infinitely less than the father because he doesn't know the day or hour. Well, only problem on Rahul, why I didn't go to Mark 14 right away, because you see, I'm anticipating the anti-Trinitarian objection that there it shows that Jesus is a subordinate deity because they'll say the son of man is given power and authority by another. And the son of man is invited by another to sit at God's right hand. See, he's a subordinate secondary deity. So the Jehovah's Witnesses will use that to prove their position, Alan Ruhl. So you have to think like a chess player, Alan Ruhl. See, apologetics is like a game of chess. You got to think in advance of your opponent, and you got to be 10 steps ahead of him. No, hey, if I quote this, this is what he's going to say. Notice what I did. I started with the explicit passages where Jesus is explicitly identified as Jehovah God of the Old Testament in the flesh. And then these passages do not show that he's a secondary, lesser, subordinate deity. He is an eternal divine person, equal to the Father in essence and nature, so that whatever these passages mean, they cannot mean he's not equal to the Father in essence and glory and majesty. You see what I'm doing? Rahul? Alan Ru Ruhul. Rahul, sorry. Ruhul. Can you change your last name to Raul? It'll be easier for me to pronounce. This is why it's not sufficient just to present your case from the context of what like-minded Trinitarians believe. Because no Trinitarian is going to disagree with you. No Trinitarian is going to say, no, Alan, that shows he's sub subject. Always think what the opponent would say, right? Be wise as serpents. Know what the serpent thinks, but innocent as a dove. And don't be unaware of the schemes of the devil and his children. Be aware. Hold on. If I say this, he's going to say this. So I'm ready for it. That's how you have to think to be an apologist to make sure you destroy every objection, demolish every argument set up by Satan through his children, to dethrone the triune God. Because the triune God lives and he cannot be dethroned. You see? That's how I think. And I'm not trying to boast. I'm just saying that's how the Holy Spirit has prepared me to think. Wait, you use this, this is what they're going to say. So are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. You get my point? No, I just want, I want people, I'm teaching you as well. That's relevant to the topic. Why I didn't go to Mark 14? 
as many Trinitarians do. Because I know a Jehovah Witness will amen that passage. A Jehovah Witness will say, yes, Jesus, son of man, who was given power, dominion, and glory. See, someone gave it to him. That someone is greater than him, and he's not equal to that someone. Yes, Jesus sits at the right hand of Jehovah, but Jehovah invites him to sit. Why would he invite him to sit if he's equal? You see the point? Now you got to respond to that. Exactly, Alex. That's why I want to provide a service for all Trinitarians. I want all Trinitarians. I know a lot of Protestants won't like me for this. That's okay. All Trinitarians, Catholic, Orthodox, Assyrian Church at East, Protestants. I want to benefit all of you because you're Trinitarians. And you need to step up for the glory of the triune God. You need to worship him, love him, live for him, adore him, and destroy objections that seek to dethrone him. Yes, right. Coptics as well, brother. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's what they think, Talithi. Talitha. Ah, Talitha. I'm sorry, Anna. Now you decide to show up and say something, Anna. Now I got your attention. Oh, yeah. All right. I won't do that again. Okay, now I'll respond to that objection. I'll respond to that objection. What do you do when an anti-Trinitarian uses Mark 14, 62 against you? I'll respond to that. I promise you. But so far, have I made a case from Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 6, even from Mark 13, if you go back and re-listen to yesterday's session, Jesus is depicted as doing the things and saying the things that the Old Testament attribute to Jehovah alone. We will get there. Mark 14, not 16. Have I been able to conclusively establish that point? Has that sunk in? Is there any doubts that what you learned from the first chapter of Mark, Jesus is the Son of God, so he's not the Father. The Holy Spirit comes upon him in visible shape as a visible sign to John. This is the Messiah filled with the Spirit, who will be working in union with the Spirit. So that means Jesus is not the Spirit, and the Spirit's not the Father. So there you have it, Father, Son, and Spirit at the baptism. But Mark begins, Mark 1, and then continues to confirm this point and unpack this theme, that though Jesus is the Son of God, He is the God of Israel who was to come. He is the human enfleshment of the God of Israel, Jehovah in the flesh. Please learn these arguments. And I gave you the links. Pass them on. Teach them. Okay, now, if that's the case, let me unpack what Mark 13, 32 is simply stating. Right? I know it's going to be hard. So now if you want meat, if you want seminary level education, and I'm not trying to boast, because the perfect seminary is the Holy Spirit seminary. And the perfect <clears throat> professor is the Holy Spirit. So we're all now enrolled in the Holy Spirit seminary, trusting the Holy Spirit, our God, to teach us and guide us and give us eyes to plunge the depth of Scripture. Okay, now, with that said, let's go back to Mark 13, 32. Exactly, they have on the rule. That's why you, me, and Ariel, we're going to start a seminary. And all the proceeds will go to my favorite charity, myself. All right? So you and I and Ariel are going to start a seminary. He's going to continue writing my Sahih collection. And all the donations and proceeds to the seminary will go to my favorite charity, the Halal Hogan Foundation. Okay. Mark 13, 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Okay. I've already established conclusively. I've already established conclusively, you can't read Mark. You can't read Mark thirteen thirty two in isolation of the chapter itself and the preceding chapters. Here's the link again. This link articulates what the Bible teaches about the incarnation. What does incarnation mean, and what does it imply? Okay, now follow with me. We know that can't mean Jesus isn't Jehovah God, right? Not because I I don't want Jesus to be a creature. We know from the context of Mark, that statement cannot mean Jesus isn't Jehovah, right? How do we know that? How do I know it cannot mean that he's not Jehovah? I 
how do I know that Mark 13, 32 cannot mean the son is not Job in the flesh? Not because I want to believe in the Trinity or my tradition says so. Exactly sort of truth. Because he's gone out of his way in the 12 preceding chapters to show he's Jehovah God in the flesh. But he's also shown he's not the father and he's a human being. So this is what you need to emphasize. We don't emphasize enough. Mark has shown Jesus is Jehovah God of Israel. Of Israel. But he's also shown he's a son of God, so he's not the father. And he's also shown he's a human being, a true human being, flesh and blood human being, a Jew, right? All of this, Mark has confirmed. Jesus is not the father. He's the son of the father. And Jesus is a flesh and blood human being. All of these factors must be taken into consideration to properly understand Mark's view of Jesus. Okay? So, since Jesus is the God of Israel who became flesh, he actually became a flesh and blood human being. And in his humanity, he took on a human nature that's finite, limited, temporal, meaning it's not beginningless. It has a beginning, but he'll continue to possess that human nature forever. Let me ask you a question. So now I'm going to help you go deep into Scripture to understand the implication of your belief that Jesus is man. Would Jesus truly be human? Now, this is, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is going to cause controversy again. You get two Christians, you get 50 opinions. All right. For the traditional <laughs> Christians. <laughs> All right. For those of you who hold the historic Christian understanding of the incarnation, those of you who hold to the historic understanding of the incarnation, do you guys believe that Jesus being truly human Truly human means that he has a human mind. Thank you, Panagia. God bless you. And I hope you didn't get upset with me, sister. You know, I don't want to get you upset. Did he have a human mind? Do you guys believe he had a human mind? And that he had a human soul, spirit? Yeah. I say that because, uh, unfortunately, and you can thank my Protestant brothers, you have someone who's trying to revamp an ancient view that was condemned. Neo-Apollinarianism. -Apoll Say that five times fast. Where the soul that animates Jesus' human body is the divine soul, not a human soul that he possessed or took to himself. Anyway, if you believe Jesus, right? Jesus being truly human means he has to have a human mind, a brain, a human soul, spirit, physical body, then here's my question. As a man, as a man, pay attention. I'm not splitting him into two persons. I'm not. This is something that historically has been the view of Christians throughout the centuries. As a man, as a man with a human mind, would he be truly human if in his human mind he was omniscient? Remember, he's truly human. The exception is no sin. Truly human, like us. To be truly human means in his humanity, his physical body, limited to time and space, has to grow until he was raised immortal, right? And has to experience genuine human limitations. So in a human mind, if he knows everything, then he's not truly human. It, as a man, if he didn't need to eat, he's not truly human. As a man... If he didn't need to sleep, he's not truly human. As a man, if he didn't grow in wisdom, he's not truly human. Here we go with the question again. Yeah. You with me there? That means if you believe that Jesus is genuinely human, that means he was born as a baby. And as a baby, he grew... And he became a toddler. He grew and he became a child. He grew, he became a teenager. If he didn't grow and went through the steps that all human beings go through, then he's not truly human. But as a human being, are you telling me in his human mind, he came out of his blessed mother's womb knowing calculus? Knowing geometry? That he can speak all languages fluently? So that if there was a French person there, he'd say, we, oui, we, oui, monsieur? Then he wouldn't be truly human. 
Now, would he be truly human if he didn't have to eat, drink, have to be burped, would have to have his diaper changed? And I'm not dead. I'm, I'm trying to tell you. And would he be a true human baby if his teeth didn't grow and he didn't have tooth aches or his teeth didn't fall out? So we Christians don't focus enough on him being human. It's like him being human, we just brush aside, and it's irrelevant. No, his humanity is very relevant. It's essential to who he is. You with me there? So here is the mystery of Christ. Uh, Bible news. Let me think, figure that out. How can Jesus be David's bloodline? Boy, mm, I wonder. Oh, his mother was from David and received his lineage from his mother's side. Die, do, dot, 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 dot. All right. Now let's come back to the issue. Uh, do, can. All right. Now, here is the mystery of the Bible. Because he's one person, that one person will do things. As a human being, and that one person will do things as God because he's one person. That one person eats, but that one person is the bread of life. That one person drinks, but that one person provides living waters. That one person sleeps, but that one person gives everlasting rest. You see how that works? You see how that works? Because he's not two persons. He's one person. That one person needs to sleep, but then he says, come to me and I'll give you rest, everlasting rest. But wait, you needed to rest. You needed to sleep. Are you going to give me everlasting rest? That one person told the Samaritan woman, give me to drink, John 4. And then when she told him, I'm a Samaritan woman, he goes, if you knew who was asking you for drink, you'd ask them and he'd give you living waters and you'll never thirst. Okay, now I'm confused. You need physical waters, but you can give me waters that will thirst, uh, quench my thirst forever? That one person needs to eat food. But that one person says he's the living bread that all who comes and eats of him will never hunger. You see how it works? No, who told you he doesn't know the hour on earth, Sai Christian? You're still not getting it. So you understand how it works? However you want to try to explain the relationship to minds, Christology, a divine mind, human mind, these are all human attempts, Alex, of trying to explain the paradox of Scripture. Whatever model you come up with will be an uninspired model, meaning it's not revealed. God has not revealed to us how it works. So if two minds, Christology, makes sense for you, go for it. But it's not an inspired model. The Spirit didn't give you that model. That's why Christians are all over the map and trying to explain how the two natures can be united in one person without mixing or fusing into each other. You with me there? Leviticus, you need to go, friend. Leviticus is a troublemaker. You need to get, get him out of here. Get out of here, Leviticus. Don't come back. You're a nuisance and a tool of the devil. Okay, everyone with me here? You understand? This is a paradox in scripture that God doesn't explain how it works. So you can you have two choices. You either can affirm the paradox. Yeah, he's human, he's God. I don't know how it works, but I know it's true because Jesus is real. He walked this earth. He is risen. He's alive. He is the God man. He knows how it works. I don't. Or you can deny it. See, the faithful have affirmed all the Bible teaches. The faithful allow God to be who he is, even though God is beyond our comprehension, and we cannot fully comprehend and fathom how this works. That's what the faithful have done historically. The heretics, the schismatics, the tools of the devil, and trying to make God sensible and force God in their box have denied one of the two propositions. You want me there? So the choice is, is before you. Here's the choice. You can either say, amen, 
All of it is true because it's God's word and Jesus is real. He walked this earth. He left the tomb empty. He is alive. He is in heaven. He will come. He's not make-believe. And I affirm it all. I don't know how it makes sense, but who says that I'll be able to comprehend God? God himself says he's beyond my comprehension. I won't be able to fully comprehend him. Or you can go the route of, no, it doesn't make sense to me. And if it doesn't make sense to me, it can't be true because I got a box and God got to, got, gots to fit in it. God has to fit in my box. If he doesn't, it can't be God or this can't be the word of God. So there are only two choices. Your only two choices. Now, do you want me to show you scripture? Scripture that says, expect to find things about God that will blow you away that you can't fully comprehend. You can see that this is what the Bible says. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see it. I don't understand how it works. You want me to give you those verses? You want me to give you those verses? How many of you want those verses so that God has already prepared you? God has already prepared you in the Bible to realize. And he goes out his way to say, look, you're a finite, fallen, imperfect creature. I'm an infinite being. You won't be able to comprehend me in all my fullness. And you won't understand my ways. But that's not a reason to reject me. Know who you are. Know who I am. And submit to my word if you believe in it. Okay, now let me give you the references. Are you ready? Job 5, verse 9. Job 5, verse 9. Folks, please re-listen to these sessions because I don't want to go over the same passage because I've done Mark 13, 32 several times, but I'm your servant here to serve you for the sake of Jesus. Job 5, verse 9. Speaking of God, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. Did you catch it? The things he does are unsearchable. They're limitless. You can't probe the limits of what God does. You can't search it out. Job 9, verse 10. Job 9, verse 10. Even on the other side of glory, Jojo, you're still a creature. You're still bound to time, space. You're still limited. Job 9, verse 10. 9, verse 10, you little loser. I can't even figure you out, Protestant. You want me to figure out God? Job 9, verse 10. And by the way, loser is a compliment. Don't be upset. Job 9, verse 10. We're both getting old. Okay. Which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. So here, they're past finding out. The wonders, the miracles he does are limitless. You can't count them. So why are you trying? I don't know why. He gives verse 11. So you want to give me an extra brownie point? Guys, do you believe what the Bible just said? His miracles are without number. Unsearchable, past finding out. So why are you trying to figure it out? Why are you trying to find the limits? Right? Job 11, 7 to 10. Job 11, 7 to 10. Job 11, 7 to 10. Watch here. Job 11, 7 to 10, folks. Canst thou, by searching, find out God? Rhetorical question. Can you search and find out God? Fully comprehend him? No. Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Can you perfectly figure out God? No. Pay attention. No. It is as high as heaven. Who canst thou do? What can you do? It's too high. You can't reach the depths of heaven. Deeper than hell, meaning show. What canst thou know? What can you possibly know? It's too deep for you. You can't even plumb the depths of the earth. The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up or gather together, then who can hinder him? Wow. Job 36, 26. Job 36, 26. Watch here now. Folks, learn this stuff. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. Can you figure out the number of his years? 
They're numberless because he's without beginning, without end. See, God has prepared you. I'm beyond you. I'm higher than you. The more you try to figure him out, the more you will confuse yourself and even lose your mind. Go mad. Literally, go mad and lose your mind. So know your limit. Know the limit of your probing. This is as far as I can go. I can't go anymore. God, I don't understand this, but your word says it. I know your word is true. This is your voice, and you cannot lie. I bow the knee. Yes, Jesus, you are the God man. Yes, as man, you can't possibly know everything, but you're also God, and you do know everything. I don't understand that, but I know who you are, and I'm in love with you, and I trust you, my Lord. Right? Job 37, verses 4 to 5. Specifically, verse 5. Job 37, verses 4 to 5. Specifically, verse 5. Let's hear. After it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of the, his excellency. And he will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which, he, which we cannot comprehend. Great things he does that we cannot comprehend. Great things that he does that we cannot comprehend. Let me repeat it again. Great things he does that we cannot comprehend. So why are you trying to comprehend the God men? Amen, John. Do you believe God when he says he does great things that you can't comprehend? One of the great things he did is to become flesh, to become God, man, God who is man. Can you comprehend that? He says he does great things that cannot be comprehended, like the incarnation. Do you believe that? The incarnation, one of the great things that God has done that we can't comprehend. So why are you trying to figure it out? Why are you trying to figure it out? Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. Exactly your worst nightmare. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. Exactly, Dad Drew Paget. You see, Jesus only has 24 chromosomes from his mother. How, how did he become human? Because a human being needs 48 chromosomes. I don't know, but he's human. More human than you and I. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. To the chief musician of Psalm of David, O Lord, pay attention. O Jehovah, O Lord, O Jehovah, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting. You know when I sit and my uprising, when I stand up. Thou understandest my thoughts from afar off. Right? Thou compassest my path. You surround my path. And my lying down, you surround me. And are acquainted with all my ways. You know everything that I do and I'm about to do. Now watch this. I'm about to do. Pay attention to four to six. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Even when the word is on my tongue, you already know it. You know what I'm going to say. Thou hast beset me behind and before. You're in front of me. You're behind me. You're around me. And laid thy hand upon me. Now watch verse six. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. You see what he said? See what he said? This, knowing this about you, knowing this about you, blows my mind. I can't comprehend it. Knowing this about you blows my mind, and I can't comprehend it. You hear me there? Does that mean I deny it? Psalm 145, verse 3. Almost done with these passages. God bless you, Andrik. Keep praying that God blesses me to bless you. Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Can you search his greatness? His greatness is unsearchable. Can you search his greatness, folks? Answer the question. Can you search his greatness? It's unsearchable. Let me show you how great he is to blow your minds even more. Psalm 147, verses 4 to 5. Psalm 147, verses 4 to 5. 
Psalm 147, verse 45. Get ready to blow, be blown away with this. Psalm 147, verse 45. Oh, my neck. Ooh, feels good. He telleth the number of the stars. He can tell you how many stars he created. He calleth them all by their names. And he has a name for each star. Guys, if that doesn't blow you away, I don't know what will. He knows all the stars he created, how many there are. And each star, he has a name for it. Great is our Lord. And of great power, his understanding is infinite. See, that should blow you away. You see what the psalmist said? Man is his understanding infinite. He knows all the stars that he created, and he has a name for each one. Each one, he's given a name. Wow, his knowledge, understanding is infinite. You see the reaction? Do you see it? Scripture, right there, I gave you God's word. Isn't that like humbling? That infinite mind became flesh. That infinite mind condescended to enter the womb of a virgin and take on a limited physical body, human nature, and still be infinite. Right? Isaiah 40, for the sake of time, Isaiah 40, verses 25 to 26. Can you send Bible news to get news somewhere else? Can you send them or somewhere else, my friend? Because he's not here to learn. All right? Isaiah 40, 25 to 26. Watch here. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Who's my equal? Who can you compare me to in creation? Nobody. Now watch this. Does to show you why you can't compare me to anyone? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? That bringeth out their hosts by number, he calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one falleth. Did you catch it? Is there anyone equal to me? Is there anyone comparable to me that you can liken me to? Well, you know, if you can find someone that can count all the stars and tell me what their names are and sustains them, then you'll find someone who's my equal. Right? Okay. Let's go to New Testament. Philippians 4, 7. Philippians 4, 7. A couple more. So we'll wrap up Mark 13, 32 and take some objections. So we got to do a part four. Right? Okay. Philippians 4, verse 7. Watch here. And the peace of God, guys, one of God's attributes. Pay attention. Please pay attention. One of God's attributes. And the peace of God, that attribute of peace, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Just his attribute of peace is beyond understanding. How much more in all his fullness? How much more in all his fullness? If a single attribute of God is beyond comprehension, do you think you're going to comprehend the fullness of God? The fullness of his essence. If one attribute is mind-blowing, you can't comprehend. Imagine trying to comprehend God in all his fullness. Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. Specifically, 17 to 19. And then we'll come back to Mark 13, 32. Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. <laughs> People can't keep away. They love me. I'll tell you why in a minute. That he would grant you, according to the riches of the glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That he strengthens you by the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit strengthens your souls, your spirits, your mind. Please, Holy Spirit, strengthen us for the glory of Jesus. Watch this. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Trust in him and Christ will be in you and your heart will be filled with love and faith in Jesus. That ye being rooted and grounded in love, the love of God grounds us, unites us, and seals us. What love? Now watch here. Watch the love. May be able to comprehend, even though you won't be able to. With all saints, what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. 
that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Let's post verse 19 one more time. I don't think you guys caught this. Ephesians 3.19. Watch here. I don't know if you caught it. Notice it says, Christ's love surpasses all knowledge. You will never be able to comprehend fully and completely the depth of the love of Christ. And by the way, side note, this proves Jesus must be God. Because you cannot say of a creature that the creature's love, creaturely love, is beyond comprehension. You can only say this of God and his infinite love. So notice, in saying this, Paul just identified Jesus as God. Because he says the love of Jesus is beyond comprehension. Thank you, Paul. God bless you. But you can't say that of the love of Christ if Christ is a creature. Because creaturely love is limited. It's only the love of the creator that's infinite. So see, Paul killed two birds with one stone. He just proved Jesus is God and that his love, which is the love of God, is infinite and you can't fully comprehend. So let me ask you a question again. Let me ask the question. I want it to sink in. If the attribute of love, Christ's love, is beyond comprehension, how much more? Will Christ be incomprehensible to us when we meditate on all his fullness? If you can't even comprehend his love, the love he has for you, can you comprehend the fullness, the totality of Christ, who's not just God but human? Now, I hope I made the case. What's the case? Why are you shocked? That Jesus can be God Almighty, who knows all things, who's also a flesh and blood human being, and as man doesn't know everything. Why would you be shocked to find that revelation? And why would you be shocked that you're incapable of comprehending how that works? So, does Jesus know the day and hour? Well, as a man, in his human consciousness mind, he didn't. But as God, he would know everything. And he knows everything that the Father knows. So what's the answer? Jesus, the God-man, as man, subject to the Father's will, did not know the dare hour in respect to his human mind, his human nature. But there is a sense in which he does know the dare hour because he's God, and as God, one with the Father, he knows everything the Father does. It's not either or, it's both and. It's not either or, it's both and. Exactly, Christ reigns. Now, how does that work? I don't know. But I'm going to give you an example from science, from science to back this up. I'm going to give you a scientific proof. Let me get you the link to prove it, okay? Now, you think this is mind-boggling. We're human beings. We only have one nature, a nature that's tainted, corrupted, and finite. And even with this nature... Even science can't comprehend the complexities of the human nature. And that's just one nature that's finite, limited, and fallen. And we can't fully comprehend how it works. They're still debating, right? Are our choices predetermined by chemical reactions in the brain? Or is there something else that influences the brain to affect the, right? Now, folks, can I ask you a question? If even science, the most brilliant minds, can't comprehend the complexities of humanity, a human nature that's limited and finite and temporal, then why would you think you'll be able to comprehend the infinite God? Now, let me show you this. I, I use this as an illustration. I'm going to use it again. I can't play it. All right. Let me find it. I find it here. Okay, Manchurian, let me find it. Where is it, man? Dude, we used to have it, but I guess we don't have it anymore. Okay, let me see if this is it. Yeah, I think this is it. Hold on, let me find it. Nope, that's not it. Okay, I think they took it off uh, YouTube. Just give me a second to find it. Yeah, I think they took it off. 
Yeah, they took it off. All right. Anyway, not long ago, Jesse Ventura had a show. And he'd uncover all these conspiracy theories, quote unquote. And one, oh yeah, I think I found it. Is this it? I hope this is it. And one of them, he actually demonstrated the reality of hypnosis. Let me see if this is it. No, it's not working. Anyway, in the show, this is what happened. I can't find it. Hypnosis is a, is a medical fact. Hypnosis is not hocus pocus. It's a fact. If you can find the video, you'll find a clip where he's showing that the military is using hypnosis to create Manchurian candidates. People who are triggered to snap and kill. Okay, now in that video, this is what you're going to find. They brought a subject. Pay attention to this. They brought a subject. This was, and you, I used to be able to find it. I can't find it. They probably removed it. Too controversial. I, I want you to listen to this. They brought a subject. He was put under hypnosis. The person told the man under hypnosis that when you hear me say this, your foot will go limp and you're going to start dragging your foot. He woke up. They're recording this. Okay. And as he's walking with Jesse Ventura, the, the person who put him under hypnosis said the word, the trigger. All of a sudden, unbeknownst to the man, he started dragging his foot. And then he said the word and he started walking normal. When they played back the tape, he was unaware that he was walking with a limp. And he was troubled and upset that he could be controlled like that. What's the point? Understand what I'm about to tell you. A human being with one human nature is so complex that as humans, we have layers of consciousness. You have your waking consciousness. This is our waking consciousness, okay? I'm awake and I'm conscious. Oh, phone, yeah. But you have another layer of consciousness, a subconscious component, that in your waking consciousness, you don't recall and have access to. In other words, a person can trigger that layer of consciousness, what we call the subconscious mind, feeds you with information that when you're awake, you don't remember. Because in your waking consciousness, you don't have access to it. Now, folks, can you imagine that? That you as a human being with one nature, you have a subconscious mind in which everything you've experienced is stored, but in your waking consciousness, you cannot recall. How is that possible? Can you explain that to me? How is it you can implant information in my subconscious mind that when I'm awake, I don't remember? But once they trigger my subconscious mind, all of it, you understand? All of that information is stored in your subconscious mind from the time you came out of your mother's womb. And if someone triggers it, he can get access to all that. But when you're awake, you don't have access to it. So if you are a man with one nature and you have layers of consciousness, and there's an aspect of your consciousness that you know a lot more that you don't recall. Why would you be shocked that Jesus is the God man? As God he's a, has an infinite mind, as man, he has a mind. And there are layers of consciousness to that mind. So that on a deeper subconscious level, he would know more than his waking consciousness. Why would that shock you? So what am I trying to get at? There is nothing out of the ordinary with Jesus being the God-man who as man cannot know everything, but as God, he knows a lot more. When we find in human subjects, human creatures only have one mind that on one layer of consciousness, they know a lot less than on, on another layer. In their subconscious mind, they know a lot more than in their waking consciousness. You get my point, what I'm trying to get at? So when you can figure out how humanity works, how the human mind works, and understand it perfectly, then you can venture into trying to figure out an infinite mind that took on a human finite mind. Is that clear? Everyone with me, or did I confuse you? Did I bore you? Did I put you to sleep? Everyone, is it making sense? Is it sinking in? Let's not get into side talks about DNA and X and Y and Z, ABC. So 
What's the answer to Mark 13, 32? Does Jesus day the, know the dare hour? Depends. As a man with a human mind in his waking consciousness, he doesn't know. But as God, who has a divine mind, who is one with the Father, he knows everything. So it's not either or. Jesus, he's the God-man. There are things he says and does as a man, but there are things he says and does as God, because it's one person who's God and man. As man, he sleeps. As God, he gives everlasting rest. As man, he eats. As God, he's the living bread. As man, he drinks. As God, he gives you living waters to quench your thirst forever and ever and ever. Thank you, Atu. You with me there? So if that's clear, let's unpack this, put the icing, and seal the deal. We're done. We're going to be done with this, and I'm going to take some objections, and we're going to have to do a part four. Right? Is that clear? Let's go to Mark 10, 45. Let me show you something. Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. Read with me. I hope you were blessed, and I hope I didn't torture you guys, honestly. I hope you were blessed, challenged, and stretched. And I hope this session was used by the Spirit to make you fall more in awe of the Bible, how beautiful the Bible is, how deep the Bible is, how rich the Bible is, and how amazingly beautiful the God of the Bible is, and that you fall more in love with the God of the Bible. Okay, Mark 10, 45. No, Josh A., friend, don't try to be a textual critic. You're going to embarrass yourself. You're talking about Matthew 24, 36. Don't try to pretend to be Dan Wallace. You're no Dan Wallace. Sit there and listen and be humble before Christos Anesti humbles you. Mark 10, 45. Guys, post it, post it again. Mark 10, 45. Mark 10, 45. Sir, ignore your footnotes, Josh. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Folks, did you see what Jesus' role was on earth? His role on earth was to be a servant. Notice what he said. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and offer his life as a ransom. So Jesus' role on earth was what? Jesus' role on earth was what? Servant, right? Servant. Now, Let's go to Matthew 12, 17, 18 to see a servant for who? For the Father and for us. He became the Father's servant to serve us. Okay, but Matthew 12, 17, 18. Matthew 12, 17, 18. Watch this. And all the Gospels teach this. All the Gospels teach he came to assume the role of a servant, to become the Father's servant slave to serve us. Matthew 12, 17, 18, okay? That it might be filled with, fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, speaking of Jesus, God the Father says, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Now, did you catch it? Jesus on earth took the status of a servant slave. He becomes the father's servant slave to serve us. Why am I emphasizing this? Because let me show you what Jesus says about a servant. John 15, verse 15. Jesus knows and doesn't know. It's not either or, it's both and. Yep, that's in John 13. But now John 15, 15. Notice what our Lord says. Guys, let's see if you can make the connection here. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. So I'm, you're not just servants. You're more than servants. Because I'm going to tell you what I do. But did you understand? A servant does not know what his Lord does. But I've called you friends for all things that I've heard of my Father have I made known unto you. Did you catch it? Let's see. I want you guys to use your mind. Think like a chess player by the power of the Holy Spirit, spiritual chess. If a servant doesn't know what his master does, only knows what his master wants him to know, why would that shock you that Jesus on earth, being the father's servant, 
will only know what his father wants him to know in his human consciousness. Will only know and communicate what his father wants him to know and communicate in his human mind, human consciousness. You catch it now? You see the principle at work? He humbly becomes the servant slave of the father. And in that role, in that role, he will only know what the master wants him to know, no more, no less, and only convey what the master wants him to convey, no more, no less. Did you catch it? Is it making sense? Now, for you Christians who believe in the totality of Scripture, the totality of Scripture, I have an article showing from Mark that Jesus is omniscient. I already showed that in Mark 2, that he's omniscient because he knows the hearts of all men. Do you want that article where I show that Jesus knows everything in the Gospel of Mark, even though in Mark he says he does not know the dare hour, that in Mark he exhibits omniscience, that he knows everything? Mark 2 was one, where he knows what they're thinking in their hearts, right? Do you want that article? Okay, let me get it for you. Because I want to wrap this up, and there's some objections I want to answer. Some objections I want to answer. Okay, here it goes. And we're going to wrap this up. I hope it was a blessing. God willing, I should be on tomorrow, if the Lord wills. Here you go. Here is my article, Revisiting the Omniscience of the Lord Jesus, a Markin Perspective. Folks, when I tell you we have articles on everything related to the core doctrines of the Christian faith, I'm not lying. We have articles on everything related to the core doctrines of the Christian faith. Here it goes. I demonstrate that the same gospel Mark, in Mark, Jesus exhibits divine omniscience, right? So here it goes. Save it. Now, since we are Christians and we believe in the totality of Scripture— let me show you that Jesus on earth was omniscient. Jesus on earth was omniscient before the resurrection and even after the resurrection. John 16, 30 to 31. But we're going to read 29 to 31. John 16, 29 to 31. Uh, Christian Finland, I don't care what you think and what it appears to you. You're not important to me. You don't like it? Bye, 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 bye. Because any theory you postulate is uninspired. It's a theory. Okay? So if you don't like it, hit the road, Jack. Don't come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Bye-bye, Christian Finland. Bye-bye. Take a hike. No one cares for what you got to say. You're not that important, at least not to me. Especially not to Ariel, because he's going to be writing my side collections, not yours. Okay, John 16, 29, 31. John 16, 29 and 31. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Now, do me a favor, because this passage is so powerful. Quote, quote it either New King James or ESV. New King James or ESV. Anna, ASD is a Muslim who doesn't care about the truth. He comes here to attack and criticize. So, guys, be wise. Don't waste your time responding to people who don't listen. Say, I made a policy. I wouldn't block these people. That was my promise. But don't entertain them. Please. A lot of snack bar. A lot of snack bar. Okay. John 16, 29, 31. 16, 29, 39, Mr. Alzheimer's. 16, 29, 31. Either New King James or ESV. Stick with me, folks. He, his disciples said to him, See now, you are speaking plainly. You are speaking plainly. Plainly? And using no figure of speech, you're speaking literally. Now we are sure that you know all things. <whistles> He's on earth before he dies. You know all things. 
and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Do you understand what they just said? Before his death and resurrection, Jesus speaks plainly, and the disciples say, now we get it. Now we understand. We now realize you know everything. You don't need to be asked in order to be tested whether you know what you're talking about. We're convinced you know all things and you came from God the Father. Did Jesus rebuke them? Hey, what are you saying? I don't know everything. I don't know the dare hour. Shut up. You finally believe? Did you catch it? So now, Sai Christian, everyone else, did you catch it? Before the resurrection, while he's on earth, he knows everything. Wow. Now, what about after the resurrection? John 21, 17. John 21, 17. After the resurrection. Three weeks after the resurrection, he appears to the disciples again. John 21, 17. Watch here. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Two important things to learn from this, maybe even more. Guys, follow me. Two important things, maybe even more. This is now after the resurrection. Peter confesses, Jesus is the Lord who knows all things. The same confession disciples made before his death. So on earth, before his death and after his resurrection, he knows all things. But notice here another important fact. God doesn't ask questions because he doesn't know. God asks questions in order to either get you to make a confession or to expose your stiff-necked, hard-hearted, sinful, rebellious minds and spirits. What do I mean? Peter was asked three times, do you love me? And he said, Lord, why are you even asking me? You know all things. You already know whether I love you or not. So notice why Peter's hurt. You already know whether I love you or not because you know all things. So why are you asking me? So notice what you learn here. Why, why did God ask Cain, where, where, where's your brother? Or why did God ask Adam? Adam, where are you? What you're learning here is God is not asking because he doesn't know. Either God is asking to get you to confess or he's asking to show that even when you're confronted, you are so stiff-necked and evil and rebellious, you refuse to confess and repent. Let me give you an illustration. With Cain, when Cain killed Abel, God said, where is your brother? Cain said, how do I know? Am I, bro am I my brother's keeper? And then God said, what have you done? The bloods of your brother cry out to me. You see, Cain, you see how wicked you are? You thought you could hide the murder from me. You thought I didn't know you killed your brother. And here when I asked you where he is, in order for you to repent, you don't repent to show you how corrupt and evil you are that you think you could lie to me and get away with it. You caught it there? So now why is our Lord asking Peter, three times, do you love me more than these, meaning more than the fish, more than your occupation, more than your job? Why three times? You guys already know this. Why three times? Notice it's the Trinitarian pattern, right? Three times, Trinitarian, but beside that. Exactly. Because he was restoring Peter for every denial he made a confession of love. You see how gentle Jesus the shepherd is with his sheep? Look how loving, look how gentle he is with the sheep. Peter denied Jesus three times. Instead of Jesus coming to Peter and saying, shame on you. Now what do you got to say for yourself? You denied me. You betrayed me. Now I stand before you, risen. How dare you? What audacity do you have to... That's not the shepherd. That's not the shepherd's heart. See what the shepherd did? The shepherd humbly, gently, he doesn't say, Simon, do you think I still love you? No, 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 no. He doesn't say that. 
He says, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love me. That's the first confession for their first denial. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. That's the second confession and doing the second denial. Simon, do you love me? That's the third confession undoing the third denial. Jesus humbly was restoring Peter and removing his shame and guilt. That's who Jesus is. He's not like me. I'll tell you, I'm, I, hey, thank the Lord he's not like me. You know why he's not like me? There are people who have hurt me and betrayed me, one of whom is my ex-wife. And may God heal my heart and cleanse my heart and fill me with the spirit to be Jesus to her. Because in my mind, I imagine her groveling like a dog with tears and saying she made a mistake. And me saying, see what you did? You deserve it, you piece of garbage. But then I'm not being Jesus. I'm being a hypocrite. I'm not being Jesus, right? It is natural to lash out, to attack to belittle and humiliate someone who's hurt you. But it is supernatural. It's Christ-like to say, I forgive you. You're forgiven. Who am I to hate you? If Jesus could forgive me, a sinner who deserves hell, who am I to sin in judgment of you? That's how you're going to know you're Christ-like. Pray for me because that's my weakness. I'm confessing. I am confessing. Because I haven't seen my girls and I'm heartbroken because my girls are not in my arms. And when they tell me, Baba, I love you and we want you, we want to hug you. Anger and hatred fills me. And I say, Lord Jesus, release me. Lord Jesus, release me, please. Please release me to love and forgive. Give me your heart. I'm weak, folks. I am. I'm weak. I am. But if you, if you want to be Jesus and if you want to know... You are being Christ-like. You do what Jesus did. When someone comes asking forgiveness, you don't say, get the hell out of here, you piece of garbage. You trash. Never talk to me again. That's not Jesus. Right? Say, I want to make this a teaching moment. I don't want to just give you theology. My prayer is in these sessions by the power of the Holy Spirit, I help you learn the faith as I learn the faith, explore the depth to be amazed of how beautiful the Bible is and how amazing the God of the Bible is and then to live it out for the glory of Christ, practically. That's not being Jesus. You know what Jesus, being Jesus is? I forgive you. It's done. It's over. Don't worry. Hey, the Lord has forgiven you. Who am I not to forgive you? The Lord has forgiven you. Who am I not to forgive you? Now, let me give you some passages. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Let me show you. I hope I'm not boring you guys. I hope I'm not boring you. I hope you're still learning and you're falling more in love with the God of the Bible. See, ASDF, I don't know why he's here. Why does he come here? Anyway, Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Guys, pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. And I'm going to do a session unpacking our Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven. I promise you, Lord willing, I'll do that. Now watch here. Okay. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow. <whistles> there you go. Jesus is going to say to you, how can I forgive you? When you didn't forgive him or her. That's in our Lord's prayer, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he says, if you do not forgive, if you do not forgive, then my father will treat you the same way. The way you treat others, my father will treat you. You don't forgive, he won't forgive you. You show mercy, he'll show you mercy. But hold on, let me complete the thought. Let me complete the thought. Can I complete the thought? Can I complete the thought? It's conditional. There's a condition that has to be met. Luke 17, verses 3 to 4. Luke 17, verses 3 to 4. 
Luke 17, verses 3 to 4. Let me complete the thought. Watch here. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. We're waiting for verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Conditional. Do not let people deceive you and mislead you. And I hope Luis is listening because I want her to learn this. Jesus says, you forgive those who ask for forgiveness. You forgive those who turn to you and ask for your forgiveness. But he's not saying forgive those who don't ask. See, that's the thing. Just like Jesus is ready to forgive you, but if you don't ask, he doesn't. So there is a condition. Yes, forgive your brother if he asks for forgiveness. If he doesn't ask for forgiveness, rebuke him, chasten him, shame him, and have nothing to do with him. So when people tell me, you shouldn't be talking about what your ex-wife did. Who told you you shouldn't be talking about it? Forgive her, brother. How can I forgive someone who doesn't want forgiveness because he or she thinks there's nothing for them to be forgiven for? So what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? If they repent and ask, you forgive. If not, have nothing to do with them and hand them over to the Lord. Let me further prove that from Paul. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5. Are you learning? I hope I'm teaching you sound theology by the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5. No, Luisa, you are right. So this is why I felt in my heart to call you, call your attention. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5. What does the church say should be done to someone who's immoral and unrepentant? Pay attention. I'm not making it up. This is scripture. It is actually reported that there is sexually, sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the, the Gentiles. Even the Gentiles are not this low. Even the Gentiles are not this perverted. Unbelieving Gentiles who worship gods and goddesses don't even do what you're doing. You, you make them blush. They're even embarrassed by your perversion. And what's the perversion? That a man has his father's wife. He took his stepmother. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he was done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, meaning I'm united with you by the spirit, the same spirit that oversees the church is the same spirit that oversees me. And I'm united with you by the spirit. And I agree with you with the spirit that's present in you and me. Okay. Have already judged as though I were present. Him who has done this deed. Now notice what he says. Pay attention to what he says. Right? <clears throat> In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, I'm there with you in spirit. Meaning, though I'm not there physically, no, I'm in agreement with you. My spirit is in agreement with you because when you do something that is of the Lord, Count me in. I'm part of that. Okay? And here's what the Lord would have you do. With the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, the authority that Christ has given us, deliver such a one to Satan. Throw him out of the church. Hand him over to Satan's territory and do domain so that Satan will then destroy his flesh that a spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, let me explain to you what that means. Let me explain to you what that means. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 to 13. Luisa, there's nothing coincidental. You know this is the Holy Spirit speaking, right? What more proof do you want, Luisa, that the Holy Spirit is real and he loves us and he's in our lives because he answers questions that you have unbeknownst to the one answering them, like me, okay? Now here, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13. Watch this. Watch. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Christians... Have a backbone. Paul said, anyone sexually immoral, you the church, do not keep company with him. 
Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of the world. He's not talking about unbelievers. I'm not saying you can't talk to unbelievers or sexually immoral. They don't claim to be Christians. They don't submit to Christ. They could care less about the law of Christ. So you can't impose Christ's law on them. So I'm not talking about unbelievers. You have no choice but to interact with unbelievers and work with them. Right? So I'm not saying the sexually immoral of the world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. If that's the case, you can't deal with unbelievers at all. You have to go live in a monastery. So I'm not talking about not interacting with unbelievers. Here's what I'm talking about. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral, right, of the world. But now I have I written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. Don't keep company with someone who says he's a Christian who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner. Not even to eat with such a person. Shameful what the church has become. Shameful what the church has become. Because let me read 12 and 13. For what have I to do with judging those also are outsiders? Do you not judge those who are inside? You judge the church. Outsiders will be judged by God on the day of judgment. But here's what you need to do. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone who's a brother that, that is sexually immoral, covetous, idolater, reviler, drunkard, extortion. Don't eat with such a one. Verse 13. But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. We live in a pitiful, shameful situation where you have churches that welcome in people claiming to be Christian who are adulterous whores, sexually immoral, practicing homosexuals and lesbians. You name it. And they do nothing to throw them out. Louisa, because your church is a joke. It's a disgrace to Jesus. It's no church. May the Lord shame them. I remember one sister that was still in contact with my ex-wife. And I'm not trying to make it personal. She was still in an affair with that Puerto Rican guy. We were not divorced. And she got me out of the house. And this sister was still talking to her. And I sent her a message. I go, is 1 Corinthians 5 in your Bible? This claim, you claim to be a Christian. Is 1 Corinthians 5 in your Bible? Or is that a missing chapter in your Bible? What are you doing speaking to this one and liking her posts and commenting in her post, knowing she committed adultery and destroyed her family and you claim to be a Christian? You want me there? The church is not your house. It's God's house. And the owner of the house tells you how to run, how to maintain, how to manage his household. No, Razzles, she avoided me like the plague till this day, this wicked, evil woman who thinks she's a Christian. Avoids me like the plague, but the Lord will chasten and shame her. Okay. Jesus sets the rules for his house. And you know what he said to you, Christians? All of you claim to be Christians. If you have someone that says he is a Christian, she's a Christian, but is fornicating or committing adultery or homosexuality or lesbianism or lying, an extortioner, you name it. What Paul named, you rebuke them. You better stop doing this. Otherwise, you can't come back to the church and you are not welcome in my house. So you don't just forgive unconditionally. Your forgiveness comes when there's true repentance. You want me there? Struggling with lust, Christos, and Esti, and justifying your lust is two different things. Brother, we all struggle with lust, if we're going to be honest. Acknowledging it's a struggle, acknowledging it's sin, and hating it, that shows that you are not someone who is justifying your, your lustful passions and excusing them and still trying to be a Christian. So you're different. We're not talking about someone like you. We're talking about someone who willfully commits sexual morality, knowing it's wrong and has been told, but justifies it anyway.
And again, I'm going to use my, my ex-wife as an example. You may think I'm bashing her. No. She knew that's adultery. She knew she was defiling herself in the household and still doesn't repent and still hasn't repented because she's with another man. Because, guys, biblically, she has no grounds of remarriage. She committed adultery. And the Bible says if you commit adultery, you can never remarry because any time you marry someone else, you make that person an adulterer and there's no blessing in your life. Did you know that? That's biblical teaching. Her brother condemned her and said, I will not talk to you till the day I die. Because that, that's a man. Anyway, so you get my point. I wasn't using this to try to bash her. Honestly, I'm not. But I'm going to be. Because remember, it is not biblical. Don't say, brother, you shouldn't be. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you cover over the sins of someone when their sin is blatant out there before God and results in destruction of a family. Nowhere does the Bible say cover those sins. You know when you cover a sin? When the person is broken and repents and asks for forgiveness, that's when the sin is covered. You never mention it. You never bring it up. It's gone. That's when the sin will be covered and never be mentioned again when repentance takes place. Phil, why are you still here, brother? Didn't I send you on your merry way? I don't know why you're here. Do I have to pay you not to come back? So anyway, I want you to understand, how did it come in with Jesus? Let me tie it in. John 21, 17. Jesus knows everything. He's omniscient. What's the context? Jesus is restoring Peter, restoring and healing Peter for betraying and denying Christ. So what was I... So there is a method to my madness. Don't think I went off topic. I'm tying in with that example. Why did Peter say, Lord, you know all things? You know I love you? Because Peter was asked three times, you love Jesus. And so he got hurt. You already know if I love you or not. Because you know everything. You know all hearts. You're God in the flesh. And then I use this as a teaching lesson. Folks, do not be hoodwinked or deceived. If someone is in willful sin and has sinned against you, and you show that person their sin. They don't repent. The Bible says bring it to two or three witnesses. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Bring two witnesses and say, look, this person has done this. They won't repent. And if they don't repent, bring it to the church. And if they don't repent after the church gets involved, you know what Matthew 18, 17 says should be done to that person? Matthew 18, 17. Watch here. Matthew 18, 17. And Lord willing, we're going to do part four tomorrow. Matthew 18, 17. Watch here. Watch here. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. In other words, don't consider him a believer anymore. He is a heathen, a denier of the faith, a pagan. Get rid of him. Until he or she repents. So yes, you forgive those who repent and seek your forgiveness. But someone who does not repent but justifies their sins and tries to excuse their sins, especially the narcissist who are always the victims and everyone else is the villain, that person, you hand them over to God, ask God to heal your heart so you don't have a bitter root that makes you angry and spiteful and hateful so you can't focus on the Lord and have nothing to do with that person. That's what I do. What I'm at, I have nothing to do with the mother of my kids. Won't talk to her, won't acknowledge her. It's done. But here's where I need you to pray for me. Thank you. Here's where I need you to pray for me. If and when she breaks and grovels before the feet of Jesus, true repentance if the Lord grants her that, and she cries and asks for forgiveness, can you pray for me that God will have healed me and given me the heart of Christ so I can be Jesus to her? Because I'm, I'm being honest. I'm not a superman. I'm a sinner. I don't want to see her or acknowledge her till the day I die. But because I love Jesus, I don't want to do what my flesh wants me to do. I want to do what Jesus wants me to do. Can you pray for me that God will help me to be Jesus, even to those who have destroyed my family, right? 
And when I say forgive her, I'm not saying go back to her as husband. No, that's over. I can forgive her and be a brother in Christ to her. I don't have to be her husband again. That's over. I'm free. That I pray the Lord has set me free. I'm done with that. But anyway, I hope you learned. I hope you learned a lot tonight. I hope you learn the depth of scripture, the beauty of scripture. I hope you learn how beautiful and majestic and awe-inspiring our God is, how real our God is. And I hope you learn that Jesus is the perfect God man, God and man, two natures, united in one person, and that he is real, he is alive, he's risen. And I hope you learn a little, little bit more about forgiveness and repentance. Let me repeat. In your heart, ask God to heal you and let go of anyone who's hurt you. So you don't become bitter and hateful. And that hate consumes you where you can't focus, where it handicaps you and depresses you, where all you're thinking about what that person has done and the injustice and you hate them. Because then you will be handicapped, right? You're now in bondage, incapacitated. But it doesn't mean... You are to reach out to them, speak to them, have nothing to do with them until they repent. And if it's sincere repentance, then Jesus says, forgive. Luke 17, 3 to 4. If your brother sends, re rebuke him. Don't hide it. Don't cover it. No, brother, you shouldn't be talking about what you did. No, I should. Rebuke them like Paul rebuked that Christian in a letter inspired and preserved. Like God exposed the adultery of David and Bathsheba, didn't hide it, but exposed it and recorded it for perpetuity. You want me there? Is that one clear? Luke 17, 3 and 4. If your brother sins, rebuke him. But if he repents, forgive him. If he sins 70, 77 times a day and repents, forgive him. Notice it's conditional. If he repents, if not, have nothing to do with him or her, let God deal with them. Were you guys blessed tonight? Were you blessed? Did you learn a lot? Honestly, don't, I know you won't tickle my ears. Did you learn a lot and got to see how solid the evidence is from the Bible that God is a trinity. How clear the evidence is that Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, the Son of the Father, eternal companion of the Spirit, and no doubt. And there is no objection against the trinity. If you understand what the trinity is, if you understand the two natures of Christ and the biblical basis, and I hope you learned something about forgiveness. Did you learn something about forgiveness and when to forgive and when not to? Did you? Honestly, I don't, I don't want you to take my ears because... My job is to be used with the Holy Spirit to help you understand the word, to dig deeper into the word, to be more of the word, and live out the word by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So guys, please, covenant with me. If I've been a blessing to you, bless me in this way. First and foremost, learn this material. Love Jesus more and more. Live for him more faithfully. Pray for me. I love Jesus more and more. Live for him more faithfully. Pray for my daughter's health and safety. God, protect them. Convict their mother to fear the Lord, repent. Pray I can hold them this year permanently. And they stay with me. That God does a miracle. They leave Chicago and live here. Not just visit me. Live here with me. Pray God will remove that man, Martin, from their lives. I don't want another man in my daughter's lives. I want to be in their life so I can be a godly example for them. Please pray for that. And pray God will provide for the ministry and pray God will continue to use me. As long as Jesus gives me health and holiness, I will serve every one of you till I die. That's my promise by the power of the Holy Spirit. As long as the Holy Spirit is pleased to give me health and holiness, I will teach until Jesus takes me home. And I hope you don't mind me teaching you because I may not say this. I do love you guys. I may get angry and impatient with you, but that's just human nature. Right. And Lord willing, sometime this week, I'm going to start a series on the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. I'm going to unpack that. Pray for it. I have to do another session on being born of water and spirit. And Lord willing, tomorrow I'm going to do part four on this and we'll be done. 
Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah Almighty in the flesh to the glory of the Father and the Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. We worship you. Save us and our children and our loved ones and seal us in your love forever. And Lord Jesus, save me from error and compromise and help me to be Jesus to everyone. Help me to be you, Lord Jesus, to everyone here, my brothers and sisters who are Catholic and Orthodox and Assyrian Church of the East and Protestants and Coptics. Lord Jesus, let me be you to them. Love them for your sake, Lord. Serve them. Let them know I am the slave of the Trinity. We are the slaves of the triune God. And my passion and love is to worship you and glorify you, Father, Son, and Spirit, Lord Jesus, to glorify you till I die. And Lord, bless my daughters and keep them safe. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Maranatha. In Jesus' name. I love you guys. Lord willing, tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hit the like button. Pass this information. Save the links. And pray for the mods, too. They're a blessing to us.